Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're going to get into part two for Sabaton History's Attack of the Dead Men. And I said yesterday that I was going to get a quote that I had heard about a first person perspective of uh, a gas attack on the Western Front. I can't remember if it was at Ypres or not, but uh, I said yesterday I was going to find the quote and I found the quote. So I'm going to give it in just a few minutes. It's really brutal. So just a heads up on that. Also, almost finished with The Big Short, the first movie reaction about the 2008 financial collapse or economic collapse caused by some elements inside of the U.S., some institutions inside of the U.S. Um, I've got a couple more Sabaton songs I'm getting to. My World War II, How Germany Could Have Won video is, is almost finished. So I've got a bunch of stuff coming up. And I appreciate all the support. As always, if you like the channel, if you like what I'm doing over here and want to support me, like, comment, subscribe. Help me kind of grace the YouTube algorithm. I appreciate all of the feedback I get in the comments and suggestions for other videos and all that. So... It's awesome to me. I am extremely, extremely grateful um, for, for all of it. But with all that being said, let's get started. The Attack of the Dead Men Part 2. Greetings. I'm Pa from Sabaton. And you are watching Sabaton History Channel. And this is Attack of the Dead Men Part 2. Roughly five months before the deadly gas attack on Osovitz Fortress, which we covered in part one, and which the song is about, well, it's about the attack and the unbelievably brave defense and counterattack of the soldiers of the Russian Empire. Anyhow, five months before that, German meteorologists began studying the winds in front of the Ypres salient on the Western Front. Behind their lines, more than 160 tons of pressurized liquid chlorine were being stockpiled to be unleashed in one devastating attack. Then, in the early morning hours of April 22, 1915, in concert with an artillery bombardment, the cylinders were opened. Okay, so... I did not know that this was what they were going to get to, um, but I'm glad they did because this, like I said, this is where the quote comes from. So before they get into all of it, I'll, I'll read the, the quote. The first one, uh, by the way, the first time I heard this quote was on Dan Carlin's uh, Blueprint for Armageddon series on World War I. It sent me into a rabbit hole of looking up first person sources and all of this stuff because it was it the, the quote was just seared into my brain. But the first one is from historian Eric Dornbros, and it says, quote, stretching six thousand meters along opposing lines and bellowing high up into the air, a thick, ghastly looking green yellow cloud of gas moved eerily and threateningly with the breeze across no man's land. The gaseous monstrosity took on a pinkish hue from certain angles as the descending western sun shone through it. To compound the shock and terror, German heavy artillery began to lay down a pounding barrage. Two French colonial divisions and a Canadian division were caught completely unaware. Quote, Take a look at this, sir, said one Canadian artillery observer to his superior, as he stared through binoculars at what looked like, or at what was coming towards them, there's something funny going on. Then he dove for cover from in incoming shells. But just then the wind shifted, compressing the gas cloud over the Algerians, whose forward units were engulfed. The soldiers grabbed their throats, choking and writhing in excruciating pain from the searing chlorine gas. In minutes, many hundreds lay drowning in fluids given off by their lungs, Seeing this, others panicked, dropped their rifles, and ran, leaving a six-kilometer gap in the line. So that is the historical view of what happened, right? They freaked out. It was uh, 
something they did not understand. They didn't know what was coming towards them and panicked and, and ran and left a six kilometer gap in the line. Now, the first person quote is from Private William Quinton. He is a British private uh, who experienced a gas attack about a week after the, this first initial, um, you know, the first initial use of the chlorine gas at Ypres. Um, and he, this is brutal, just an FYI, but he writes... Suddenly, over the top of our front line, we saw what looked like clouds of thin gray smoke rolling slowly along with a slight wind. It hung to the ground, reaching to the height of eight or nine feet, and approached so slowly that a man walking could have kept ahead of it. Gas. The word quickly passed around. Even now, it had no terror for us, for we had not tasted it. From our haversacks, we hastily drew the flannel belts, soaked them in water, and tied them around our mouths and noses. Suddenly, through the communication trench came rushing a few khaki-clad figures, their eyes glaring out of their heads, their hands tearing at their throats as they came on. Some stumbled and fell, and lay writhing at the bottom of the trench, choking and gasping, whilst those following trampled over them, and if ever men were raving mad with terror, these men were. What was left of our section still crouched at the support end of the communication trench. Our first, our front line, judging from the number of men who just come from it, had been completely abandoned. And now we waited for the first rush of Germans to come on. But they did not come. Our biggest enemy was now within a few yards of us and in the form of a cloud of gas. We caught our first whiff of it. No words of mine can ever describe my feelings as we inhaled the first mouthful. We choked, spit, and coughed. My lungs felt as though they were being burnt out, that they were going to burst. Red-hot needles were being thrust into my eyes. The first impulse was to run, but we had just seen men running to almost certain death and knew it, rather than stay and be choked into a slow and agonizing death. It was one of those occasions where you do not know what you were doing. The man who stayed was no braver than the man who ran away. We crouched there, terrified, stupefied. A large shell burst on the parapet just where we were sheltered. We were almost buried beneath the falling earth. Young Addington, a chap about my own age, was screaming at the top of his voice and trying to free his buried legs. He got free, and before we could stop him, he rushed off, God knows where. We then saw the reason for his screams. His left arm was blown off above the elbow. He left a trail of blood over my tunic as he climbed over me in a mad rush to get away. And then the last little bit um, is this group of reserves moves to the front where the gap has just opened up, and they are holding the front basically and this guy um, William Quentin describes what he sees whenever he first walks gets up to the trench he says quote black in the face their tunics and shirt fronts torn open at the necks in their last desperate fight for breath many of them quite still, while others were still wriggling and kicking in the agonies of the most awful death I've ever seen. Some were wounded in the bargain, and their gaping wounds lay open, blood still oozing from them. One poor devil was tearing at his throat with his hands. I doubt if he knew, or felt, that he had only one hand, and that the other was just a stump where the hand should have been. This stump he worked around his throat as if his hand was still there and the blood from it was streaming over his bluish-black face and neck. A few minutes later, he was still, except for occasional shudders as he breathed his last. Um, okay, so that was the quote that I had heard and that I wanted to that I wanted to have everybody else hear. The song is great, and these stories are are obviously 
interesting and cool and and terrible in the same way but i wanted to give the reality for what it was for the soldiers who were in the trenches who who actually experienced this and and that's why i wanted to do the quotes but let's go ahead and get back into it at first the bombardment did not cause much alarm to the allied soldiers on hill 60 but Aside from the usual smoke and sound of the shelling, there was something different this time. A wall of greenish-yellow fog up to two meters high was slowly creeping towards them. It was driven by the wind and had a Swedish chloric smell. From the rear of the lines, the officers around French General Henri Mordac could see sudden unrest and confusion in the forward positions. Soldiers of the 45th Algerian Division were suddenly standing up, crawling over the parapets, waving their arms. Men were then simply abandoning their trenches and streaming to the rear in a hurry, coughing, spitting, retching. Most were clutching their throats. Their eyes were red with pain. They were oblivious to the shells falling around them. They stumbled back or collapsed on the ground, gasping for air. As we looked to our left, we saw a thick, yellowish-green cloud veiling the sky like a cloud of vapor. We were already affected by the asphyxiating fumes. I had the impression I was looking through green glasses. At the same time, I felt the gas upon my respiratory system. It burned in my throat, caused pains in my chest, and made breathing all but impossible. I spat blood and suffered from dizziness. We all thought we were lost. General Henri Mordac. Then the British and Canadian lines beside them were hit as well. Those struck by the cloud fell unconscious and died with twisted limbs and blackened faces. The chlorine gas filled the trenches, leaving them full of men choking and gasping for breath, some foaming at the mouth in every degree of agony and distress, incapable of offering any resistance to the advancing enemy. The Germans on the other side... And, and like it said in that quote that I read... Or, or what it referenced to, what do you do? What do you do? If, if you stay there, you're going to die. The chlorine gas is going to kill you, and it's going to kill you in just the most horrific way. But you're in the trench because of the shells and machine guns and rifle fire and everything like that. So if you get up and leave, you're, you're going, in, in all likelihood, you're going to die. So, what, what do you do? Do you take your chances and get up on the parapet and, and make a mad dash for it? Do you wait for the cloud of gas to come choke you to death or burn you from the inside out? Like, if you're a soldier on the front here, what, what can you even do? I had watched, at first hesitant at what to do. Once the gas began to dissipate, though, they charged into the wide open gap. It was thanks to the defense of the survivors of the British 15th Brigade, who held their ground in this chaos, that a large breakthrough was prevented. Of the 1st Dorsetshire, 46 men had been killed by the gas and more than 150 more were affected, blinded or, or vomiting on the ground. But still, the gas-stricken men held their trench. Through determination and sheer iron will, they manned the machine guns long enough to fight off the rushing Germans until reinforcements could be brought in. Of those who are still living, very few are expected to recover. We found our dead everywhere where they had crawled to get out of the way. Hill 60, quite apart from our losses, is a terrible sight. Hundreds of bodies all over the place, terribly mutilated. A large number of our own men and a large number of Hun. Stench is awful as they cannot be buried. Never quiet enough to do that. So they lie as they fell, silent spectators of modern warfare. CMS Shepard, 1st Dorset. News of the gas attack circulated immediately. The Allied press accused the Germans of committing a terrible war crime. The use of poison gas was seen as horrific diabolical, and stood against all civilized warfare. It simply broke the rules. Okay, okay, 
The Germans had pushed the gates of gas warfare wide open, but the concept of chemical warfare was not new by any means. Since ancient times, soldiers had poisoned their blades and their arrowheads with toxins. Back in 80 BC, we know that the Romans used clouds of caustic lime powder to flush out a tribe that was hiding in a cave. But the Age of Enlightenment sought to put limits on suffering during wartime. The first agreement about the prohibition of such chemical weapons dates back to 1675, when the Holy Roman Empire oh, wow. and France both agreed to not use poison bullets anymore. Oh, I did not know that. I did not know it went back that far. The Hague Convention of 1899 expanded on this agreement by prohibiting shells solely filled with asphyxiating or debilitating gases. Yes, the, the Hague was the one that I knew that was basically the reference point for what was used in World War I. I say used very lightly. That's what people looked at for the quote-unquote rules of World War I. But, but we know, and I've talked about this, there were no rules in World War I. The, the mercy or humanity that was shown was shown on like an individual soldier's level, not not by the leaders. The only dissenting vote at that time came from the American representative, the naval captain Alfred Mann. He argued that asphyxiation from gas wasn't that much different than condemning sailors to drown in the sea after their ship was hit by a torpedo. He was also backed by his government, who did not want the U.S. to restrict itself from using a potentially war-winning weapon. Circumventing the treaty, France continued experimenting with weaponizing non-lethal gases and were, in fact, the first to use gas during the Great War. Lacrimatory gas grenades were tested against fortresses to see if they could suppress small arms fire from within. They named them cartouche suffocate, suffocating cartridges. Such gas was indeed sporadically used by the French with 26mm rifle grenades in the opening month of the Great War but the effect in the field proved inadequate. German scientists began with similar experiments during the great shell shortage of autumn 1914. Many deadly chemicals were byproducts of shell production anyhow, and they thought to supplement their arsenal with them. Chemist Walter Nernst was one of the... F yeah, I want to say the, the chlorine gas came from like the German dye industry, I believe. It was a byproduct of that. Um, but I've talked about this in other videos. I'm, I try to be careful how I put this stuff because I know these are very, these are very touchy subjects that, that we get on when we talk about things like war crimes, right? Um, but I personally feel like Germany gets a little bit of a bad rap for World War I. Um, I think it's unfair that they are viewed historically as the side that broke the rules, right? And, and that's, not to, that's not to absolve them of the things that they did in, in Belgium and, and using things like ex asphyxiating gases and things of that nature. But if we look from today's kind of like modern lens to a, a bunch of things done by all sides in World War I, they all seem terribly brutal and awful and, and just like the worst things ever, um, you know, shooting their own soldiers with PTSD, shooting unarmed men that were surrendering or had surrendered, like there, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that was done by all sides, and I think... I think the reason that Germany is looked at that way is, one, because, well, because propaganda on the side of the Entente was really, really ahead of the curb in World War I. But two, I think we view, and I think it's inaccurate to do this. I think it's, it's, it's not best for, for actually getting an accurate picture. But I think we view World War I Germany through the lens or having the hindsight of what World War II Germany became. And I think, I think that, that jades or, or taints our, our vision or view 
of World War I Germany. That's, that's just my opinion. First, who invented such weapons of mass effect, right? By developing the nye shell, a mix of traditional shrapnel balls and 500 grams of non-toxic lacrimatory gas. The effects were also underwhelming. It was to be Nanst colleague, the brilliant and future Nobel Prize winning chemist Fritz Haber, who would go on to change the playing field. He was already critically acclaimed by the military for co-inventing an artificial nitrogen fixation process. Now he would make an even bigger impact on the war itself. While the Allies denounced his invention as a war crime, the German press tried to elevate Haber to a national hero, one who could finally break the stalemate. But there were many German generals and scientists who condemned the use of poison gas yep. as inhuman and dishonorable. Haber's own wife, a chemist, Yes, this is this is the German high command and and political hierarchy. Um, they go back and forth constantly throughout the war about things like gas or the unrestricted U-boat warfare. They they are at each other's throats about a lot of this stuff. And there's a German general, I believe, who when this is first being discussed, the use of gas. He shoots the whole thing down and says, like, the the damn wind could change direction and we would be gassing ourselves. Like, not only is it inhumane and, and shouldn't be done ethically, but it's, it's tactically dumb to put something out there that can kill you that you have no control over. Chemist herself called it a perversion of science. Out of shame for her husband's invention, she committed suicide shortly after the attack Jesus. on Hill 60 became public. Haber, however, felt no remorse. Just one day after her death, he left for the Eastern Front to instruct German officers in the use of his new wonder weapon. From May 1915, during the days of the Gorlitsa Tarnov offensive, Haber personally oversaw the release of the lethal gas attacks. At the river Ravka on May 31st, more than 260 tons of chlorine gas from 12,000 cylinders were released God. against the unprotected Russian lines. This first massive cylinder attack killed approximately 6,000 soldiers in a single afternoon. Like the British and French at Ypres, the Russians were totally exposed to the lethal gas as they lacked any kind of protective equipment. Yeah. A month later at Bzura, Two Siberian regiments lost 90% of their strength to a single gas attack. Yeah, they're putting like cloth and gauze over their mouth. Like it may be dipped in water or something like that, but it's it's certainly not a, a gas mask. Like that is, I mean, it is not going to protect you from the gas. Historical research on the amount of German gas attacks on the Eastern Front is sadly lacking, but most scholars agree that the Russians suffered more than any other nation from the effects of gas attacks. It is estimated that half a million soldiers were affected by the gas, of which around 66,000 were killed. Prolonged exposure to chlorine without protection is fatal. In just a few minutes of exposure, soldiers would lose consciousness in excruciating spasms of pain as the chemicals attack the tissues of lungs, eyes, and throats. Even the inhalation of a lower dose can still kill after 30 minutes. Some afflicted die days later. Like those defenders of Osovitz fortress, the Russian soldiers usually had no experience of gas warfare and were simply doomed until they could come up with adequate protection. In the wake of the gas attacks, Russian General Nikolai Yanushkevich urged Tsarist command to supply the army with protective gear and more importantly, chemical weapons of their own. The major problem in both regards was that Russia did not really have a domestic chemical industry. Most of their chemical plants had belonged to Germans. And they had closed up shops since the outbreak of the war. But what Russia did possess were brilliant scientists. By 1916, 
a specialized war chemical committee was formed, chaired by leading Russian chemists like Vladimir Ipatiev and Alexei Favorsky, who continued to press their government to fund adequate countermeasures. Before then, they were able to get their own chemical production running, and the first tons of liquid chlorine were produced, but still, each large-scale German gas attack caused thousands of Russian casualties. Chemist Nikolai Zelensky made a major breakthrough experimenting in Petrograd's Triangle Rubber Factory. He outfitted a rubber helmet with Prokofiev goggles, a pair of hermetically sealed glasses. Zelensky had also figured out that the use of carbon absorbent would intercept the deadly chemicals and added a respirator canister filled with charcoal to the mask. Altogether, he presented the first modern gas mask design of the war. However, what Russia lacked was not the expertise of its scientists, but modern production and distribution capabilities. Delays in outfitting their massive armies with new equipment were common, and each retreat or shape... Yeah, they, they struggled during World War I with all sorts of supplies, guns and ammo, and I mean, literally everything that you need to, to prosecute a war, there was a time where the Russian army struggled with it. So the idea that they wouldn't be able to just en masse produce a ton of gas masks and get them out makes, I mean, makes a lot of sense. Make up in the command structure, push things further back. The notorious corruption and incompetence in the czarist bureaucracy did not help much either. On the battlefield, they had been firing back at the Germans with gas shells since autumn 1915, but it was at a disadvantage that they could hardly break. Each time they got somewhere close to drawing equal, the Germans came up with some new sort of highly toxic chemical, and the Russian chemists went back to work. When phosgene gas was the new killer on the Eastern Front, it was Russian scientists who discovered that the use of phenate hexamine was an effective blocking agent. This information saved thousands of their Western allies. But while those allies could comparatively easily mass produce such countermeasures, the Russians could not. It was not until early 1917 that there were even sufficient gas masks available in the Russian army to withstand the German gas attacks, but by then, they had different problems. Yeah. In the end, not even the strongest and most protective gas mask could prevent the soldier from being affected in some way by gas, perhaps just by fear or panic. Each time the alarm would ring, when a lookout would loudly clang pots together yelling, GAS! GAS! It became a race against time. Sometimes it was mere seconds that stood between life and death. No soldier could duck away from it, nor could the soldier hope to simply withstand its effects, no matter how healthy and fit he was. And when he smelled it, it might already have been too late. For then, they were already dead men. Just imagine being one of the first, like being on the front line whenever this is first starting to be used and just how none of this would make any sense to you. Like wh what, what in the hell is going on? There's this, like there's a cloud, but it's, it's not, it's obviously something that has been released or, or put out here, but you don't know what it is. And it, it doesn't look particularly dangerous or fast or anything like that. It would just, I, I, I don't know. I can't imagine being, being there and just not understanding the devastation that's coming. And then once you do know, once there have been a lot of gas attacks, is that maybe even worse? Because then once you hear the alarm or you hear somebody yell gas, you you very much do know what's coming and you know there are more first person stories of people who had their gas mask get punctured by a bullet or or you know there's just there's some really gruesome stories about this so it's just it's a really rough topic 
Okay, now, obviously, this song was inspired by uh, events concerning soldiers from the Imperial Russian Army. But what is your Russian connection with this song? The yeah, okay. So, originally, when we released this song, it was released before Sabaton by a Russian artist called Radio Tapok. Okay. Who we allowed to hear the song before anybody else. So he had the chance to do a cover version of it. Okay, and, and did you know he was going to do that? Yeah, uh, yeah, and we even invited him to come down to one of our shows where he had some little filming where he was capturing, uh, or we are capturing him in a scene where, where like, we're, we're trying to, to torture him and stuff. And uh, he released <laughs> that seen? as a, as a <laughs> yeah. music video. Oh, wow. And um, Radio Tapuk is a, like a, he... he mainly does covers. Okay. He's writing some of his own songs as well, but he's mostly famous for writing cover songs of artists from Rammstein to Korn to Sabaton. But it and other. harder rock and metal artists. Yeah, yeah. 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 More, more like that, yes. And uh, he's doing it his style, and he's yeah. translating the lyrics into Russian. Okay. So it, it, it works for the audience in Russia very well. That's yeah, cool. And... Uh, when we did a song and he did a cover of it, we thought it sounded awesome and we were like, what, what if we one day do a crossover? Sure. And uh, we went to play in Moscow and we invited him to join us on the stage. And he came onto the stage That's and started awesome. to sing in Russian without any announcement. And the audience went crazy. It was an yep. awesome okay. moment. You wow. know, when, you, when you are able to give a pretty cool surprise to the fans yeah. and it works out that well. So I guess we can watch a little bit from that. Yeah. Now, are the Russian audiences, are they often familiar with these Russian lyrics? I mean, do people no, sing that? No, not really. Uh, I mean, when we are touring in Russia, a lot of our fans, they prefer the, the songs to be like us. I mean, yeah. they, 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 they listen to us because they like us. Yeah, sure. Uh, but sometimes it is a cool twist to the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we saw that it was not only the people in Russia who appreciated the little thing when, when and it sounded awesome and people all over got excited about it. But now you've got, he's got him, but who does he use for his band and stuff? What about the music and stuff? I, I think he has um, various musicians okay. joining him on tour. I'm and not what, sure. <laughs> that, and he releases whole albums or just the occasional single? Or, I mean, does he have a label or are these bootlegs or how does it work? Um, I guess he's it's releasing Russia. it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he's releasing it uh, self released. Okay. Um, well, there'll definitely be some links to uh, to you somewhere that, down there. Now, Per, I have to admit, I'm sorry that I attacked you earlier oh. today. You know, I know you were just trying to do your best to get the show off to a start. If we have time, we'll shoot another beginning. But, you know, we're running so short on time that that might be the only thing we're going to have to roll with it. And, and you looked fitting. I mean, you're wrapped. And uh, why are you wrapped? Well, because I'm dead. <laughs> Obviously. No, I, I know you've noticed I've, I've had this for many weeks. I haven't had this for many weeks. I've had this for two days, but we're shooting a bunch of episodes here in Fallen where the band, are, they're, they're working on some songs and new projects and new cool ideas, which you guys will hear about eventually. Some of them even here. Yeah. Right? Uh, no, I, I woke up the other morning -da 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 -da, and I went to wash dishes, which is a bad second line for a blues song. And I went to wash dishes because I had not done that the night before. And a wine glass exploded and it oh. cut my hand and I put on a Band-Aid and then I put on another one and then I put on another one and another one and I put on a fifth one and under the five of them I could still see it just filling up with blood and I uh. thought, okay, that's not good. So I had to go to the uh, district nurse and so they gave me this awesome looking way over the top bandage for far more than the cut actually deserves, you know. So, so now you know. So if you were um, trying to drink from the glass and it exploded, you would have looked very much fitting to this specific song. Yep. I really would have. 
And you know what's interesting? If I had done this you know, a couple hundred years ago, yeah, I could have died. Yep. True. You know, because <laughs> they had to do a lot of antiseptic stuff because it was a little while. Before. That's what's always funny to me about the people that are like, oh man, I feel like it would have been awesome to live in this time period or that time period. And I agree, though, it would be cool to be able to see you know, certain things or societies or people or just to get a feel for a time period. I, I totally understand that, believe me. But, but modern medicine is, is a wondrous thing. Like there, there are a lot of health related issues that we kind of like take for granted today that could have been big, big problems in a different time period before I got to the nurses because I convinced myself I didn't need to go to the nurses. So that's why I've been wearing this for the last how many weeks? I don't know what order we're doing these. But hey, um, back to a more serious subject when you talked about the face and stuff like that. Um, you know, when people think of the First World War, one of the things they do think of is gas. It's an enduring symbol of the war, yeah. which is a real shame. Um, but uh, since most, most, the majority of the deaths in the First World War were caused by artillery uh, of the active soldiers and stuff. But gas is the scary one because artillery, the, it comes and you die. The gas, you see, you know, can you, I can't, yeah, it's hard I, to imagine, you know. I, I guess it's also very, I mean, all, all the stories and the images, it, yeah. it can't be, it must be worse. As you said, you, you get shot, hopefully for your own sake, you die quickly. Yeah. Guess it's gonna take a little while. Even even it could take some years, of, yeah. you know. Yeah. That's uh, and and Matt, and think of the like just the. It's, it's distasteful. I want to say think of think of the balls of these guys, like literally falling apart and uh. choking on their own lungs, but still going. All right, we got this. You know, that's yeah. a it's a pretty heavy. Uh, it's a heavy theme, but it's a it's a really good tribute to what. To both the depths thing. of horror that men are capable of inflicting on each other, but also the depths of courage and bravery that men are capable of in and of themselves. You yeah. know? And thankfully, the end of the First World War resulted in the ban of use of this. Well, I mean, there's a couple of countries did not sign you know, yeah. the ban. And of course, in the 30s and in, in the Second World War, Japan used some chemical and biological weapons and stuff. Um, and there was plenty of gas used by the Germans in the Second World War, although not on the front lines. Hitler had been gassed himself, so he did not use that mm -hmm. against other soldiers. He thought, found that distasteful. He used it on an awful lot of other people that were not soldiers, you know, but, uh, well, we've already done, we already did the final solution. Yeah. It was one of the hardest hitting episodes of this series. And if you haven't seen that episode, that's your homework to go and see it again. Yeah, definitely. That's... I'm I'm definitely definitely want to get to it. I did not realize that that was. I didn't realize that was a thing. Some of the horrors that man is capable of, and why it's important to remember these things, to be able to stand up against them before they can happen again. Yes. So, right. All right. Well, that is it for today from Sabaton History. Thanks for watching. Yes, I talked about this for the reasoning of why I wanted to do the big short, even though it's a little bit different for something for the channel. But yeah, history rhymes. And if you don't know or you don't understand or, or you know, whatever, then, then you won't know what to look for when something like this can happen again. It's why I think that history is so incredibly important. Um, because, you know, like I gave the quote, Mark Twain says, history rhymes. It doesn't, it doesn't often exactly repeat, but, but it very, very similarly rhymes with things that have previously happened. Thank you everybody for watching and thank you everybody for supporting and those who don't do it click the bell subscribe and become a patron thank you very much
Okay, so that was the Attack of the Dead Men Part 2, Sabaton History. Like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel over here, and I will see you all next time.